Hi, I'm Ross Boyask, writer and director of I Am Vengeance Retaliation. So, you're John Gold, the John Gold. Yep. Our target, Sean Teague. You want me to bring Teague in? Alive. Boys did like giving the orders, to, didn't you, John? I'm putting a team together to catch Teague, and I want you to lead it. <laughs> Arms deals, smuggling, state secrets, assassinations. You name it, Teague profited from it. Brace, brace! Move! That's what it comes down to. Me and a quarter ounce of lead. Don't tempt me. You're taking Teague to prison. Three square meals a day and a roof over his head. After everything he's done. Years of loyal service, and I'll get thrown on the scrap heap. Well, that's no excuse for betraying your own team. <laughs> this is bigger than what Teague's done to either of us. <laughs> Teague, you're coming with me. Yeah, of course I am. Run! <laughs> Yeah. Paid overtime for this, right? Well, thanks for all your help. You know, you might be the most polite mercenary I've ever encountered. That's very kind of you to say. Now we're just starting to have some fun. I wonder how many people he's killed this week. Five. So far. Hello, everyone. This is David Najir from Watcher Pass, and we are today joined by two very special guests. Uh, Mr. Stu Bennett and Mr. Ross Boyask. They are, Mr. Boyask is the director and writer of I Am Vengeance Retaliation and Stu Bennett is the star. You also might know him as a former WWE superstar. Uh, they're here to talk to us about the film and kind of, um, you know, just give us some insight on the filming process and what it went to make the movie. Uh, I guess we can just start with uh, our first question, you know, given the times right now and, and the whole shutdown. Um, you know, this seems like a movie that was tailor made for release in theaters with big sounds, big screens and big explosions. Um, you know, I guess you've, you've pivoted to a digital release. It's available digitally on pretty much any platform anywhere. So you can all check it out. But how, you know, I guess, how was this originally envisioned? Was it envisioned for a big screen? And I guess how did the pivot to digital, if, if that did happen, how did that occur? Yeah, this is this is actually a sequel. Um, I am Vengeance Retaliation. The first film, I am Vengeance, came out in 2018, and that did have a, a limited theatrical run. The plan for this one, it is a bigger budget film, um, was to have a, a wider release in the theaters. But unfortunately, as we can tell, everything's been shut down. So we are doing VOD only at the moment. Um, it is available on all major v VOD platforms. But I think. There's actually a benefit to it in the current climate with everyone sat at home. It might actually play out pretty well for the film. So fingers crossed people support it. It's not a huge deal that we didn't have the, the theatrical run. It would have been nice to have the premiere and all that kind of thing. But I think in general, when you look at things like uh, Top Gun 2 and some of the bigger movies that have been shut down and completely yeah. canned for the time being, I think we just wanted to go ahead, get the film out there. We knew the fan base was certainly calling out for it. So I'm glad it's out there and VOD isn't a major problem. Yeah. Oh, may I add to executive producer Stu Bennett as accredited on this film? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good on my IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the first thing I noticed about this film is that there is a plethora of the stunt performers and actors and people notable from all across the board, from different backgrounds, from just different lengths of, uh, of experience. It's literally just a mixing bowl. So I have to ask the two of you, uh, one, to, to you, Stu, how is it to work in this big mixing pot? And then also to you, Ross, about how you go about casting this basically, I, I, I don't know, you know, when you're like kids and you put all your action figures together, and they'd be a Ninja Turtle versus a wrestler. You just put them all together and say, have fun. Like, that's what it felt like. There was so many people from all over and it was just amazing. But how was it knowing that you were about to assemble this cast? 
Uh, me personally, um, obviously having worked with Stu before, we obviously knew he had the chops to do all of the action stuff, of course. Uh, and um, a number of the other cast I'd worked with previously, or at least I knew, you know, whether it's friends of friends, uh, the, dare I say, the martial arts slash stunt action community in the UK is a fairly tight knit one. So when you tend to work in those circles, people tend to know each other or meet each other at social events or, you know, screenings and things nice. like that. So um, when they came to someone like, for example, Jean-Paul Lee, obviously everyone knows Jailbreak and Night Shooters, and he's amazing. He's mm -hmm. also one of the warmest humans ever, just a nice person, super modest and so forth. So it was really exciting to be able to work with him. And obviously his fighting style is completely different to, to for example, Stu. Um, but then, of course, you've got Phoebe Robinson Galvin and Katrina Durden, um, who have different backgrounds, but are both incredibly authentic fighters in real life, uh, as well as uh, on screen. Uh, they have very different styles, uh, and I think they really complement each other. So you know, when it came to casting those, uh, I was going to say guys, that's not great, <laughs> those two roles, um, we had a few actresses come in, well, more than a few, but, but uh, certainly a handful of actresses who could handle the physical skills. There really aren't that many who, who have the, if you like, the combination of uh, dramatic skills and physical skills. Um, and it really did come down to a bit of a, a crunch because we, we love both of them, uh, like in, you know, their auditions. They both auditioned for both roles, just in case people didn't know that. And it really came down to a decision between, you know, who was going to play which role? Um, and, and in the end, I think we made the right choice. And uh, yeah, they, they both, I think, just I think they both deliver incredibly well. Yeah, and I'd say, um, as you mentioned, the variety of people that are in the film in these fight scenes. I think there's 16 fight scenes in this film. I'm probably in about eight of them, and I'm involved with different people throughout the film. And um, I think it it almost harks back to my wrestling days where one night I'd be wrestling against Rey Mysterio, who is 150 pounds and he's flying around like a ping pong ball. The next night I'll be wrestling Big Show or Mark Henry, who make me look like a, a, a baby rag doll or sort of throw me around <laughs> like I'm nothing. So you, you learn with your fighting style and wrestling very quickly to be able to adapt to, to different people and, and other people's styles. And, and that's kind of the nature of the game in professional wrestling. And very much in this film too, it's the, the same. So one moment I'm fighting Vinnie Jones, who's a big, tough street fighter. Mm -hmm. The next day I'm fighting Katrina Durden, who again is the, the Rey Mysterio type, bouncing around, jumping 10 feet in the air and kicking me in the nose, as everyone seems to do. And then the next day I'm fighting with Joe Egan, who's a, a big Irish guy. He's a former heavyweight boxer, used to fight with, used to train with Mike Tyson, and he's a big just tree trunk of a man. So um, I like that. It means every fight scene that I'm involved in, I approach differently and it's going to come off differently. And I'm always going to play to my strengths, which is kind of grappling, dirty fighting and, and ground and pound, picking people up and throwing them around if I can. Um, and I love the fact that I never never quite know what my opponent is going to bring on the fight scenes in, in this film too. So that's always, always very fun. a lot of fun. It's kind of like a chess game putting the fight scenes together. I, I totally agree. And, and, I, and I think, and, you know, as a, a sort of a two-part question to this is that, you know, as much emphasis if you're talking about the fighting, this, this movie did showcase a lot of gunfights. And I know you said you had prior to limited experience coming into this film with gunfights, and it's not really the thing in the British scene. It's not, you know, a lot of the times you let the hands do the talking. Was it always designed to make the gunfights look irrelevant in this film? Where like the gunfights, a lot of the bullets didn't land that ultimately captivated to the fact that people happened to come face to face with it. Was it always designed to be that way to say, hey, we can do it this way. I know gunfights is a big, a big thing in American culture, uh, with action films, but we're we're taking another avenue. We're gonna we're gonna let the skill do the talking. Was that always the vision? Um, for, for my part, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, there's like two parts to this. First of all, there was one of the aims of this as a sequel, even though you don't have to watch the first movie, mm -hmm. was to kind of go bigger and better. So some of that was you know more firepower, just like we had some explosions, just like we had more fights, mm -hmm. you know, a bigger scale production. So the aspect of the pyrotechnics, if you like, just being in there, that was an aim. In the end, I've always preferred it kind of going hand to hand. Um, one of the intentions originally was, particularly in the final showdown, uh, we were going to have another team of guys turn up, like almost like cannon fodder to, to help Teague. Uh, and then, of course, the strike team and, and uh, Stu as gold, we're going to kind of take those down with the guns and then the guns kind of run out and then you get to the hand to hand. 
Um, there were a number of reasons, you know, I, I don't really want to talk necessarily budget, but there was, you know, we had, we had a very short amount of time to do things. And in the end, we preferred to focus on the main characters, just bringing in some random bad guys to get shot. In the end, kind of that, if you want to talk about irrelevant, that kind of felt irrelevant, except just to give more bodies hitting the ground, which, let's face it, as an action movie, you know, it never goes astray. <laughs> um, but, but in the end, I was kind of, I was kind of aiming much more for however this sounds like an A-team type thing where, yes, you're right, the bullets could go everywhere. But in the end, it really comes down to the characters facing off with each other. A, a gun is easy. I mean, they even say in Enter the Dragon, right? You know, settle it. Yeah, right? With yeah. like a gun. If we did that, the film would have been over. In about <laughs> <Yeah. time>. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like, like stupid short. Short. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are so many opportunities for that could happen. And I appreciate how... In, in a modern action film, some of that can kind of come across as, and I'll use this word lightly, goofy, because in the end, we're looking to do a fun action movie. We're not looking for violence. The first movie was more of a violent revenge thriller for anyone who's seen it. We were going for a much more, dare I say, lighter action movie, more of a chase movie, more of a, there's more humor in it. There's more interaction with the characters, particularly for Stu and the strike team guys like Ninja Superhero. So, in many ways, it was more about that. And then, yes, coming down to the hand-to-hand. And one of the reasons behind that, I've said this a number of times, is in the end, a fight scene for me, and I, and I think for most of us, is the same as a dialogue scene. Every character moves differently. Stu has his own trait. In real life, Stu has his own background, let alone a strong goal, right? And therefore, if 10 different people attack Stu in the movie, they should attack different ways. They'll have had different training, even if they're in the same army unit, but they'll all have different backgrounds. One guy might be, you know, a Muay Thai guy. One guy might be a BJJ guy or whatever. whatever. Um, and therefore, obviously, Gold would then respond differently to all of those attacks, right? He may have his own training, and, and you know, but, but like, it, 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 it's, to me, throwing a punch is the same as throwing a verbal insult. Yeah. I hope that that makes sense. And then again, mm-hmm. yeah. Stuart's goal would have yeah. his own response to that and so forth. So much like any kind of script writing and, and any kind of storytelling, it's kind of cause and effect. Um, and that's where someone like Tim Mann, the choreographer, comes in as well, because he, he's a very collaborative storyteller. Not, you know, he doesn't just throw a left hook. <laughs> you know, there, there's a there's story to every fight and there's characters in every fight. That was probably a bit of a long-winded way of going about it, but that's kind of the... When you're talking about if the gunfights were irrelevant, I think they are compared to the more personal interaction of, of getting you know, hand to hand. Well, yeah, and your your analogy for a, a verbal insult was um, was perfect for me because I you know I, I did like that aspect where you've got gold fighting you know big strong fighters and you kind of overpower and then you've got him fighting you know Katrina Durden who's a lot faster and a lot quicker and then you get you know you get to see how, how he handles someone that maybe is a little more agile. And so that, uh, you know, that, that's a nice aspect of a hand-to-hand fight that you really don't get to see if it's just all gunplay, as you said. Right. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the earlier question, this is, this is for Stu. Uh, you know, you mentioned that preparing for this is kind of similar to, you know, when you were fighting in WWE where you would have, um, you know, you'd be fighting a different person every night. You just kind of have to prepare for them that way. But I guess how does preparation for this movie differ for you you know did you change up your routine obviously you probably had to have some you know maybe some weapons fire although maybe you're already experienced enough to not have to worry about that uh how, how did this kind of prepare, preparing for this film differ from i guess your your previous roles very much rolling with the punches to be honest with you the nature of indie film and the budgets we have <laughs> and the, the the time we have to actually prepare for it is all very truncated as much as we would love to have these hundred million dollar hollywood budgets where you get six months to shoot this and if it doesn't go well don't worry we'll, we'll push it back and film that again we very much have to go with it and, and figure it out a lot of times on the fly um and that again harks back to wrestling i'd turn up at arenas sometimes and the flight would have been delayed we get the arena 20 minutes before the show starts and i'm the first match okay who am i wrestling get your gear on you're in with that guy in 20 minutes and get yourself warmed up too in that time and a lot of the time the fight scenes were very much prepped you know an hour before we shot where we'd have a quick chat figure things out with tim man look at the layout and okay we've got to start shooting soon because we're going to run out of daylight or, or whatever it is so um a lot of very much you know working on the fly figuring it out as we go along in terms of prep for the gunfighting and, and gunplay, I'm not particularly experienced in that in real life. It's not a very common part of British culture to actually have guns, unlike the US. I've got a lot of friends who have a ton of giant bazookas and all this stuff. But in the UK, it's all illegal, so we don't have them. Um, so it did take me a, a little bit of time to get used to, to various guns, but I've now done, I think this is my fifth film. 
Uh, I've had guns in every single one. And now it's kind of a cumulative effect of being used to handling guns, how to hold them, how to walk with them, how, where to put your shoulder, how to react when they're popping um, and, you know, ducking behind barrels and all this stuff. So very much cumulative, getting better at it every time. And um, I think the hand-to-hand -hand fighting stuff is something that comes very naturally to me now. And, uh, and that's probably the easiest part of the gig for me, although it hurts the most, obviously. Uh, on that point as well, actually, I should also mention Armory Effects, who are an amazing special effects and, and Armory uh, team. Absolutely incredible. They would train people, sometimes, yeah, on the spot. Uh, occasionally, we'd be doing a take or, or about to do a take, and we would see in a distance uh, a, a shadowy silhouette, suddenly a, a flash would come out from a distance. And we realised, for example, so, uh, like Greg Burridge was trained in the Desert Eagle, and it was just like the loudest, most percussive sound <laughs> at distance. And then we were like, action. <laughs> it's the dialogue scene that we were about to play. So, yeah. <laughs> but they're an amazing team and they really, you know, they really ran you know, the, the actors through their paces as well. Even just, I'm sure Stu will tell you, just walking, holding a gun is not a natural thing yeah. for most people, probably, yeah. let alone someone who's supposed to look like a professional soldier. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I got. I'm kind of laughing over here if I can even ask the question. But you did say that this film was going to be uh, a little bit more lighthearted and a little bit more comedic from the first film, and indeed it is. But then you cast Vinny Jones in the movie. <laughs> hey, hey, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Vinny Jones is a funny guy. <laughs> For those who don't know, Vinny's I a want, funny guy. I want the stories, but I, I want. I definitely want the stories. But so, so Stu, are, I mean. You yourself definitely wanted the, the the biggest baddest out there, whether it be in films or sports entertainment. But standing across from the legendary Vin Jones, I think he he has to be the most iconic British actor out there, easily, right? But Absolutely, like, I'm. A yeah, go, uh, just how how was that moment? It was like, hey, so uh, I know this is a uh, the film circled around you, but uh, by the way, Vinnie Jones got casted. So, uh, <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'll be honest. I'll be honest with you. Well. I was. I was thrilled when Vinny got, got signed on to the film because, um, first of all, I'm a big Vinny fan. I loved soccer growing up, and he was a notoriously tough guy soccer player. I've loved his films. He's been in so, so many amazing films like Snatch and Lockstock and all these great films. My biggest concern, if you, uh, you're you obviously a wrestling fan, Najir, and like my entire wrestling career for the best part of 15 years, I was always a bad guy. I was a bad guy because I wrestled like a bad guy. I taught like a bad guy. It helped that I was in the US and I was an Englishman, so they, they tend to dislike the Englishman <laughs> in wrestling anyway. Um, so I was always the bad guy. One of my big concerns when I signed on to, to work on the I Am Vengeance franchise a few years ago was that I was now going to be the hero or the good <laughs> guy. I was like, I don't know if I can pull this off. And what, what drew me to the character of John Gold is he is a very dark good guy you know he's uh pretty mean he's nasty mm -hmm. he's got a lot of bad intentions but deep down he's got a good heart and the things mm -hmm. he does even though he's a bad guy are really for good reasons so that's what makes him the good guy now one of the reasons i was always the bad guy in wrestling is that for the most part i'm big i'm imposing and generally you want the bad guy to be the 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 kind of the, the biggest guy in the fight and you want yeah. the good guy to be the underdog because people have mm -hmm. this tendency to pull for the underdog, the smaller guy in the fight. And that's traditionally how wrestling works. Mm -hmm. um, so my concern was, okay, it's great that I'm going to be the good guy. I can pull this off. But who are we going to have opposite me? <laughs> Realistically, is going to put a, a six foot six, 250 pound guy with a busted nose and my reputation. Who's going to put me in jeopardy? And it, one of the, the biggest concerns is finding a guy, especially in the film world, where actors are generally pretty short, whereas wrestlers are generally pretty big. Mm -hmm. And finding someone who was good for that. So when they told me, oh, we've got Vinnie Jones as the bad guy, I was like, perfect. Man, <laughs> yeah, he, he's going to out bad guy me, whatever. So this is, he's the perfect guy. He's, he's six foot two, so he's, he's a big guy himself, and he's just an iconic, evil bad person in yeah. cinema he's one of the best bad guys i've ever seen and especially mm -hmm. you know with his reputation in the uk that goes outside of film too and his name value around the world so i was absolutely thrilled and uh, i got to be a, a bit of a fanboy around him for the yeah. entire duration <laughs> of the shoot and pester him for stories of his soccer career and all this stuff and uh, yeah a lot of fun working with him and what a killer performance he puts in too you say that again uh, yeah, and again the, to the question yeah what are some of the funny stories maybe terrorizing stories or interactions that you both have had uh, during filming for this? I'll let Ross handle this one. I'm terrified of Vinny, so I don't know what to Because I'm so much bigger and stronger than Stu. I can... <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can 
like to well, you, you hired um, you hired Vinny, so you can yeah, you can no, talk well, about well, it. Well, well, uh, well, you know, uh, full credit also should go to John Adams and Diane Shorthouse, the producers of the film, uh, of course, uh, as well. Uh, and um, no, before before um, Vinny, before we started shooting, we had a great conversation for about 40, 45 minutes uh, from this place in LA. And we, we really talked about the character and his thoughts on it and, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and that was great. And um, for me personally, like, first of all, I'm not joking. He's a funny guy. Like, like you may not always necessarily know when he's making a joke <laughs> because of his demeanor. He's a great, he's a great straight guy. Like, I mean, I mean, like, like, you know, stone faced and he'll say something and sometimes it takes a minute for you to get he's taking the piss like he's you know so that was that was always good fun and it's kind of unpredictable and that was enjoyable um but on a, on a more serious note as a filmmaker one of the things i loved about working with him was that um between takes you know we, we would run a scene we'd shoot the first take most of our takes were pretty darn good if i may say so for everybody involved uh but we'd do two or three in the end usually right if we had time um and what was interesting was watching Vinny um between take one and take two right so he clearly have been cogitating on what had happened in the previous take and he would give up some different options you know for the next for the next take nothing major nothing wild but he would you know perhaps focus on another character for a bit longer or you know whatever and and look most actors do that too let's be real uh but what billy brought was like the experience of so many movies and so many tv yeah. shows right he you know, this is this is you know he he has process beyond what i probably someone like myself understands you know I, I try to work my actors as closely as possible um so he brought a lot you know to i would say to to his own performance like he re he didn't just sit there and say it and then say it again you know what i mean he he really did think about what had happened and then made adjustments which i i loved um and um i always i occasionally heard him like offering advice to members of the cast and even the members of the crew on, on certain things you know like this not even even work for later sometimes it was other stuff uh, and I thought that was fascinating that he interacted with everybody that way. You know, with a lot of people that way. So, um, yeah, I don't remember what the question was, but I really liked working with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it would be it would be remiss of me to not add here that Vinnie Jones, very nice guy. I would have been really disappointed if we didn't at least see some glimpses of the cataclysmic crazy man, Vinnie Jones, <laughs> when the cameras weren't rolling. And believe me, we did see it. I remember on... Probably his second, first or second day on set, I was in my my uh, dressing room, which was at the end of this long hallway, and I just heard this explosive screaming down down the, the end of the corridor, and I was like, what on earth is going on? And I cracked my door open and looked down there, and I saw Vinnie Jones like he was the Tasmanian devil, spinning around, yelling, screaming at anyone in his direction. I still, to this day, don't know what it was about. Because I, I immediately closed my door, locked it, and pushed my couch right in front of the door. So I was going to be safe. Because believe me, I, I play a really good tough guy in film and in wrestling. In real life, I am not. And I want no part of that. And I have to say, Ross, uh, Diane Shorthouse, and John Adams, the, the producers of the film, they dealt with the situation and nullified it. But I had my little glimpse through the crack in that door of what Vinnie Jones is all about. And thankfully, after that, I got along with him great. And I made sure we did not fall out because that was the warning I needed. But yeah, we saw that too. He's a, he's a really nice guy, but I saw that glimpse. Oh. <laughs> Stu, by all means, blink two times if you need help. <laughs> I'll be good. I'll be good right now. I, 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 he's in LA, actually. We both live in LA. I haven't bumped into him since. So. Stu is actually still locked in his trailer right now. He hasn't, he hasn't left yet. I was going to say, do you, do you need us to call someone? <laughs> hey, hey, Ross, I'm in Vinny's basement right now. <laughs> now. Now that I think about it, Ross, like, how was it for you to write lines for Gold and Teague and to actually see it come to fruition, considering oh, those two opposing characters and, like, oh. the feel to it, you know? Yeah. That's a really... I think you might be the first person who's asked that, actually. Um, I don't, how many podcasts have we done now, Steve? My brain. Um, this is 40, 41 for me, this yeah. one. I've, I've done a crazy run. <laughs> oh, they like you more than they like me. Um, <laughs> so, 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 no, honestly, to that, to that question... Um, so obviously Stu and I have worked together before, uh, which is great. And Stu always brings his opinions on each scene and obviously the draft when he gets the draft. Uh, in the sequel, I was obviously writing more for what I know Stu to be and hopefully then go beyond that. You know, we were looking, I'm sure Stu will remember this, we were looking to, dare I say, expand the range, right? Like open gold up a bit, get a bit more history, 
He's not just a, a you know a, a taciturn killing machine. Mm-hmm. In the first movie, I think he had a few humorous moments, regardless. Um, but perhaps they're a bit more internal, like you know, like disappearing from view and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Whereas this was much more, if you like, I don't want to say jokes because they weren't jokes, but they were just. I just think we saw a bit more into his personality as a human, kind of opened up, particularly with um, Lynch and Shapiro, but also to a degree with his scenes with Billy. So, so to that point, uh, what was really important in the writing was we had to have an idea of history between gold and tea. I didn't want to get into things like that time in Bulgaria when you screwed me over. I didn't want that stuff. You see that stuff all the time. Uh, it's very 90s Marvel comics as well. Uh, but like, but, but what we needed, there's, there's a fight in the middle of the movie in an alleyway where we do get a bunch of little moments of story between them that come out. Uh, and we just didn't, we didn't want to go too deeply into that, but we wanted to get, you know, how would these two guys talk with each other, right? Like, yeah. how would they... And, and in many ways, again, those moments lend themselves to whether they're attacking each other or defending from each other and all of it. You know, certain attacks came up with particular lines of dialogue, whether that's obvious or not. I don't know. So, um, so that was, that, that was, yes, that was an intention from the beginning, how they kind of verbally spar. Like even in the scenes where they're trapped in the van together with the sniper attacking them, things like that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that was all there. Um, we would run a scene. Everyone had their ideas. We, Vinny was very keen to make sure that we got to the core of it. Originally, Teague was, I would say it out loud, honestly, overwritten. The villain tends to be a bit overwritten. And we did strip it back a bit. And I think that worked really well. Sometimes it's just in the eyes, right? It's not just about, you know, like a, a monologue or anything like that. Yeah. So just as a, a moment on top of that. So, so that was very collaborative in the end, I think. And I think when we ran it through, we, we understood it. We would realize if something was being perhaps a bit too repetitive or something like that. That was great. Um, but I will say, as as the writer, and I try not to be too precious, but as the writer and director, the first time Vinny said a full line that I had written and hadn't, like, you know, made an alteration, which was, I, I fully respected when he did that, but the first time he said the line that I had written, inside I went, yes! <laughs> yes! And I'm going to tell you what line it is. Right now, obviously, we shoot this all out of order. This isn't particularly late in the film, yeah. but the line is: <laughs> Vinny is running away from a, a kind of a skirmish, and Stu catches up with him on a motorcycle, and Vinny stops and goes, "Fuck me! You're like herpes. I can't get rid of you." And when he, <laughs> when he, he just when he said that, I went, "Yeah, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> like a child." Um, but but the thing I would say is it felt very normal coming out of his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he's kind of like a tough, bad guy, you know, like villain, etc. It never felt weird to me. And I think that was an interesting point. I think, I guess, where the writing, if you like, and the intention and his opinion on the characters intersected. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think in the end, it was a really good collaboration. It, it was always stripped back. And I think that made sense for the kind of movie that it is. With, with, the movie is a roller coaster. It just keeps going, right? Yeah. It yeah. barely stops. So there isn't a lot of time for, you know, o- overly, ex- what, like over exposition and flowery dialogue. So, yeah, it, it was, um, it, it, so, so I guess what I could say about the writing process in the end was obviously there was what was in the draft, there was what we discussed, we did a read through, all of that stuff, we then break it down. It all kind of keeps evolving, that writing process, and, and specifically between Gold and Tea, it was always evolving. It evolved on the day, it evolves in the edit. You know, it, it kind of never stops until until you know we go. You don't have any more time to work now. You have to give us. Yeah, <laughs> that was probably a lot weirded way of going about it. Dude, so I'm tra- I'm tangential. <laughs> oh, we're we're happy to hear everything. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the writing because you know this goes back to Stu's point about how he likes gold because he's kind of like a dark hero. I really one of my favorite lines is it's an early line when you know gold is introduced to the team and the, and the team goes. Oh, John Gold, how many people has he killed? You know, I wonder how many people he's killed today. And he's like, or I wonder how many people he's killed. And he's like, five today, but, you know, we'll see what happens or something like that. It's just <laughs> yeah. such a, like a stark, five. calm yeah. statement. Yeah. It's like, how many people has he killed this week? Five so far. Five so far, five. yeah. <laughs> week isn't over, right? So. Yeah. Uh, and and there, there were so many, like, perfect one liners like that. And, and the herpes uh, comment, I also caught, you know, I loved that line as well. That was, uh, that was really funny as well. So, you know, thank you for thank you. thank you for your writing in this one. It makes it makes the film just so much more enjoyable. Uh, and then going back to like the comedy aspects of this film, I think one of my favorite just 
random aspects of it is a uh, you know, I guess partway through Shapiro, who it was played by Sam Benjamin, is kidnapped and they just they take all of his gear and then he spends the rest of the movie just in red boxers and okay it's two questions like one where did that come from because i just love like just how ridiculous it looked and then he just played along like it was normal and then two how for Stu, how do you have this person in his boxers while you're fighting and just not bust out laughing the entire time like <laughs> <laughs> i'll let i'll let ross answer the first part of that yeah so okay so mm, the 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 stripping him down to his boxers part uh, is obviously just you know an escape plan. We, and we've seen this in films and TV shows, whatever, before, where you know a character kind of you know takes the outfit and and uh, and you know of like a firefighter. I mean, it happened in the guest. Dan Stevens does it in the guest as a firefighter. There are loads of examples where I think even in Dark uh, Batman Year One, Frank Miller, he you know, Batman sort of takes like a, a riot cop gear, if I remember correctly, and kind of sneaks out of a, of a situation. So it is kind of influenced by things like that. Um, it was usually also the riot the cop idea... disappears. Doesn't doesn't usually the riot cop doesn't have thirty more minutes on screen. So no, well, it, well, <laughs> this kind of comes from what happens to that person, right? <laughs> like yeah. there's a lot of characters that you see where you never find out what happens afterwards. So mm-hmm. so obviously um, uh, Shapiro, you know, the teammates rip the hell out of him. Oh, in terms of the boxers, we couldn't get close enough just because of lenses and things but on those red boxes are dinosaurs with wearing shades <laughs> uh, <laughs> i just wish we could have gone closer in but i think people might have been worrying about where my, my <laughs> that needs to be so this more. movie has taken a very dark turn here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be in like and, the deluxe super edition just like the, yeah, the super boxer in. edition my my favorite part was not the boxer shorts, but he's wearing those like old fashioned businessman sock yeah. pull up things. I don't I don't even know what they're called. I've never actually seen them in real life till this movie. But uh well, like braces called, for socks or something. Well they're called they're actually called sock suspenders. And, oh okay. And I know how this is gonna sound. When we came to it, uh, our costume designer Emily is amazing. Um I'd forgotten about the sock suspenders. Like I just, I just knew he was going to be in his underwear, right? His cap. And then I realized he was wearing the sock suspenders. I was like, you've got the sock suspenders. Like it's the 21st century. Where'd you get those now? And, and uh, Emily was just like, they're in the script. I've got them here. And I was like, oh. Um, so <laughs> that was pretty awesome. So it is a bit of a gag and it is a bit of a, a, a sustained gag for later on, if you like. I think Sam was incredibly brave, quite frankly, to do a fight with Joe Egan, who is made from cement, uh, while wearing his boxer shorts and pretty much nothing else. Um, yeah, he was he was a bit of a hero. So it, it was intended, you know, somewhat as a gag. Um, during the writing process, there were different versions. Sam will probably be quite aggrieved to find this out. Later on, I, I, in one of the drafts, he was wearing, like, like they'd, they'd scrounged him some, like, track suit bottoms and, you know, like, leggings and stuff, so he wouldn't look completely crazy. But we went balls out in the end. Not quite balls out, but basically, <laughs> <laughs> basically we, we decided to just go for it. And I think the film benefits from it in the end. Yeah. Yeah, I, think, I think very much this is a throwback to those 80s action films. And that's what the film is, really, this uh, Iron Vengeance Retaliation. It's a throwback to those 80s action films that were not meant to be taken serious. I think a lot of action films nowadays are all very serious and it's all, all got a big meaning behind it and everything's morally correct and all this. Yeah. But Iron Avengers Retaliation is not supposed to be taken too seriously. We, yeah. we have the fight scenes, we do the serious stuff, but it's, it's also this, this, the silly one-liners and the, uh, the silly moments in a film that remind you, okay, this, this is supposed to be a fun 90-minute sprint of a film. It's not... So you're not supposed to take anything away afterwards and, and look at your life and have a, a an introspective <laughs> moment about the world around you. It's nothing like that. It's an escape film. That's exactly yeah. what this is. And I think that's a, a perfect example of the the silliness that you can throw into this kind of movie that clearly would never happen in real life. But um, it's it's also there's an element of it. That, well, it's kind of kind of quirky and kind of amusing. And silliness is probably exactly what we need right now, given uh, everything going on. So yeah, I definitely don't want to be in the real world right now. That's for sure. So any any escapism <laughs> is good for me. <laughs> Um, I know we focused a lot about the men in this film. There's no way we can finish out uh, talking today without mentioning um, 
the, 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 the badass women who really, really held it down. And as much, as much as I loved your fights, Stu, in this film, that Jen versus Kate fight was, it was phenomenal. And I love the fact of how you had uh, Vinny being, uh, you know, the, the bad heel, you're being the bad face, shall I say, but you guys had much, much respect for um, uh, Katrina Dorden's character, Jen Quaid. Was it always written for it to be that way? Or did she just, because you, again, you, you like you said earlier, the shuffling between who was actually gonna get that role uh, wasn't until they both auditioned. Was her was her audition just that good that it just left a presence that you maybe had to go back to rewrite some lines and say like, hey, no, she needs to be a presence on here? Because when you talk about the first fight scene with you, amazing, but she was the legitimate threat. Even you said it yourself. You was like, hey, Sean, if you want to stay behind, well, Jen's coming by. He's like, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be, outside of you, the only bit of respect he gave about anybody in the film. So... Uh, but yeah, was it was it always written to make Jen Quaid uh, that the most imposing character in the entire film? So, writing wise, originally, but only in the first draft. The first draft, Jen was a guy. Jen Jen was uh, Doug Quaid's son. Oh, okay. Okay. Just in okay. just in the fir- just in the first draft. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was kind of just. I don't know, mulling it around, mulling it around, and mulling it around. And I'm like, if we're doing... So, so part of the idea was I wanted to keep the theme of revenge slash vengeance in the movie. And in the end, that was going to be this character's part, right? And, and, and the, the moral quandary that Gold faces is he would like to... Keep, he'd quite happily see to keep dead. But he's now tasked with essentially bringing him to justice, which is difficult for him to swallow at the best of times, let alone having to lead a team and the last time that happened it all went back. All of it, there are all of these little things weighing on gold. And then the idea of kind of the revenge character just being another guy, look, that would that would have worked, right? But you don't really want gold junior. That's not really the point of yeah, the movie. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that was in my brain was it's, it's his daughter, not the son. And, and it wasn't really for any other reason. Like, like I wasn't, I'm not doing it for any other uh, what sort of I don't want to say virtue signaling, but that kind of, it wasn't to right, do right, with, right. It wasn't to do with that. When I rewrote Jen, as in to a a woman, if I remember correctly, I didn't change a word. I don't think I changed anything, actually, because because even, even at the beginning of the movie, where we see Jen in her sniper gear with mm-hmm. a poncho, initially that could be a guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And pretty quickly after that, you realise it's a female figure. Let's be honest. <laughs> but but initially in the tower, if nothing else, and maybe when driving, it's potentially a guy, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that that was the only other little bit of um, that was the only other kind of layering, if you like, to sort of who is this person before before the reveal. Mm-hmm. If yeah, and if I remember, I'm pretty sure I didn't change anything it, it, in terms of um, what the character was. I don't think I changed anything else. I mean, I, we, we did rewriting like we would rewrite yeah. anything else, but I, I don't think I made any other. It wasn't well. Now she's female. Like I don't. There wasn't anything else like that. Yeah. So that was that was critical. So she was always past the first draft. She was always pretty much the character you see. Obviously, Katrina came in and brought her own her, her collaboration to that. Let alone her, her fight abilities and everything else. Um, and then, of course, working with Tim Man and, and, and so forth. Um, when you're talking about the auditions in terms of who played who, um, Phoebe and Katrina and some of the other actors came in as well. What I liked about them, particularly, partly there was the mix of the physical ability and the acting ability. But when they both played both roles, as every actress did, they made what I would describe as the most distinct choices between the two characters. In, in the audition, they, they they changed their posture. They changed, they just made specific choices, which I really respect is probably even the wrong word, but I really dug those choices. You could see a clear decision being made, no, uh, and particularly as they're doing those scenes, you know, a minute after each other, they sort of reset, did that, and so then it did come to a decision. And the only thing I can say that made the decision a, a bit easier, possibly, I think in the end we've made the right choice. There was a, a raw vulnerability to Katrina. There's a raw vulnerability under the tough side and, and all of that stuff and, and, the, and the agility and everything else. 
there's a raw vulnerability that she's actually been through some very significant personal tragedy, which I didn't even know about till much later. So she's able to tap into it a little. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's awesome. so in, in the very end, near the epilogue with her and Teague, she's tapping into some very, very real stuff. Not my place to say, yeah. but very, very real stuff. And it was very moving, in fact, when I, when I, when I was told what would happen. So, yes, um, that was very much a deciding factor, although I didn't know it at the time, that contributing history. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's a remarkable story. Um, and it, it, it did look so authentic. I th- again, that's why I said I felt like everybody was really natural. Uh, whether it had been their background or so on, everybody just really came together really cohesive. With different backgrounds, different walks of life. And it just, it fleshed out to just be an amazing movie. Um, so, but that's that's awesome that she was able to tap into some real personal things to really bring that character to life. Because it's, <laughs> Jim Quaid is absolutely badass. And as everyone respected, <laughs> I was respecting. <laughs> For sure. I think, you know, I think one of the interesting things is when you look at, um, historically, I was born in the 80s and, I was brought up to think women didn't fight. I didn't want to see women fight as a mm-hmm. kid. That's just how I was raised. I think most of society in the in the West was raised like that too. And then, you know, Ronda Rousey comes along and there's a seismic shift in how people in general perceive, perceive yeah. female combat fighters. And suddenly it's, wow, this, this woman is legit. And now, okay, she's getting punched in the face, but I'm comfortable seeing that for the first time in my life. And now she's punching another woman in the face. And, you know, I think there was this seismic shift really in, in people's perception of, of women combat athletes. And that plays in so well this day and age to female fighters on screen too. And I'll be honest with you going into the filming of I am vengeance retaliation. Ross told me, Hey, we, there's going to be a fight scene between you and a female and my wrestling career. I've had over a thousand wrestling matches, never once wrestled a female. This is my fifth film, never done a fight scene with a woman. I was concerned how this was a gonna look and i was concerned that i was gonna hurt her too because i'm so much bigger than her mm-hmm. but um, believe me she's such an ass kicker and she's so tough that the fight scene is my favorite fight scene i've ever done on uh, in film and um, the fight scene i do with her um, i think it comes across great and she's so tough that she actually kicked my ass in the fight too and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the cool things luckily we had two days off after this it was it was on a friday we filmed it and i had two days off because i remember that saturday morning feeling pretty good about myself woke up and like I was just hurting and she'd really kicked my ass and she's uh, <laughs> you know, as much as I was concerned for her health, I should have been concerned about my own. And she was coming at me from all these crazy angles. And, um, and that's the cool thing. Now we can have a fight scene between a 250 pound bruiser like me and a 120 pound petite female like her. And yeah. it comes across well. it looks good and it's actually believable. Thanks to this change due to the other, the Ronda Rousey factor of what yeah. society is ready to accept that now, which Five or ten years ago, and especially when I was growing up watching Arnie films, no way, you know, you just wouldn't have accepted <laughs> that. So it's it's great, and it gives gives us so much more options as actors and as scriptwriters to do these these cool scenes that perhaps weren't weren't available in the past. Yeah, and and and, and poor uh, Renner who had to face two of them at a time, <laughs> <laughs> talking trash, it, it got it the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, he, he deserves it and he knows it. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the canary in the coal mine for the rest of us on that film. Like, okay, these girls are actually really tough. Yeah, let's not, uh, yeah. let's not t- talk too much smack on this. Uh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, now, I, originally, I don't think I was going to ask this question, but I, I think it's a little bit reassuring that you said that, you know, this this film was not supposed to be taken lightly, much like I said in my review as well, too, but confirming, obviously, from you and, uh, and that this this film did have a comedic tone to it. It wasn't, it was there, especially in the dialogue, but there's something else I kind of picked up on and I've been wondering, and that's with Kate Lynch, uh, the character played by Phoebe, obviously. Was she suffering a concussion? Was that the whole compass of her character, the entire film, after that first initial blow? And then something else happened in the middle of the film, but she's always had that, like she had that little ginger of a step whenever doing anything, as if she was legitimately working through a concussion the entire film. So not the entire movie, so hope that I will have it at the beginning, but when there's the explosion in, uh, there's like a factory area yeah. and the door explodes. Yep, yep, yep. There, was, there was some stuff that we trimmed out, which was essentially the fact that she, she uh, her hearing had gone for a while. 
and so she was a bit discombobulated. In the actual edit, it didn't. It just didn't quite play. She, Phoebe was great. It wasn't anything to do with Phoebe particularly. It was more about how the scene was moving along. Um, and so there were there were a handful, not many, a handful of moments where she's kind of disoriented, which we ended up removing. Um, so that might contribute a little bit <laughs> to that kind of aspect of, of her behaviour. Um, but she also she was always supposed to be a little bit off kilter and a little bit. Um, uh, what's the word, uh, imaginative in terms of just how she behaves with like um, Sam Benjamin. She, you know, they're always kind of knocking about quite a bit anyway. So it was trying to strike the balance with her character of kind of uh, humour, heart, and uh, if you like, combat skills. So it was trying to find that balance. Oh, I got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was like, yeah, she looked like she was just a little bit general and stuff. But yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I know you guys are going to be wrapping up, uh, coming up on your time in a little bit. Uh, we just have like two more questions really quick. Um, and, and then for me, and then I'll go to David. Now, we know like in the world in the pandemic, the world is at a halt right now. It's changed a lot of different things, whether it's been a th theatrical release, um, everything, you know, moving stream forward to video on demand and so on. Um, and to you, Stu, how do you, you know, balance this, shall I say, new trajectory in your career being an action film star uh still working with nwa doing commentary obviously nwa is on a hold right now um i'm not sure really sure about within the film industry about how you being able to move forward with working on a uh, new project <laughs> ventures three possibly uh but <laughs> how do you kind of balance this new trajectory now this new norm considering uh things are just so different than how it's traditionally has been for you and and nonetheless too uh considering what you're doing in wrestling now having more leisure on your free time to do more film and stuff and then you you get this opportunity and now the world's like yeah but you got less opportunity in time yeah. now because they were like how do how do you vision all this now going forward yeah i mean it's really easy to balance at the moment because i have literally nothing to do because everything <laughs> shut down my, my all my wrestling gigs got cancelled any any uh film or hosting ideas that we were pitching and, and talking about that's all been shut down and who knows when that's going to get picked up again um yeah. so yeah at the moment it's kind of boring if i'm honest but uh, i'm trying my best to enjoy downtime and, and all that stuff but in general i would say as a professional wrestler especially with WWE, it was 100% of my life. Every waking hour, I was mm -hmm. either traveling or wrestling or sitting in a rental car, or even if I was home for 24 hours a week, um, I'd be washing my clothes, I'd be get paying my bills, probably doing a couple of phone interviews, promoting upcoming shows, then flying out again the next day. And that was kind of my life for the best part of 10 years with WWE. So yeah. I really enjoy now that I do get this usually anyway, this balance and variety. Okay, great. I'm going to go film this uh, this movie for four weeks. Then I'm going to go do some wrestling commentary mm -hmm, with NWA. Mm -hmm. Then I've got some meetings coming up about a marine biology show I'm hoping to host in the UK. And uh, then, you know what? I'm going to go on vacation with my girlfriend. I have some downtime now and I can enjoy life a bit more. And I yeah. actually enjoy that variety and almost blowing in the wind and, and seeing where we end up and not having this structured plan that uh, that i have with wwe because at yeah. times with wwe especially towards the end it started feeling like i was stuck in groundhog day and i yearned for anything <laughs> out of the ordinary and just the thought of of just sitting on a beach with no one bothering me for a few days yeah. was just the 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 dream that i could never get to and now that i have that option there obviously i i want to be busier so it's the grass is always greener it's one of those situations but i've learned as i get older to, to actually enjoy downtime and quiet periods so i'm That's trying awesome. my best to to enjoy things currently too that's awesome and, and and you bring up nwa i mean you have to have the conversation with billy corgan to get him to score one of your uh, upcoming films i'll just throw that out there by the way <laughs> <laughs> oh that, that would be cool i don't know if we can afford uh, billy corgan and smashing pumpkins that might that might eat up 90 percent of the budget in general for the film if we do that we we probably can't get vinnie jones so uh, we, that's <laughs> the that's real balance <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll need to call in some favors from Billy Corbin and see what we can do. That would be very cool, though. I mean, yeah, it's a uh, I'm a Smashing Pumpkins fan in general, and uh, I like his solo stuff, too. I actually got to see him live a few months ago, just before I started with 
NWA and what a performer he is. And I've been a fan of his since uh, in my teens. So getting to work with him, it's another Vinnie Jones type moment of, oh, wow, he's, awesome. uh, you know, a big fan of this guy. Now I'm sat here working with him. It's, it's always cool. Hey, it's possible he just scored an independent film, Skyman, not too long ago. So I don't okay. know. I just throw it out in the atmosphere. You All know? right, then. All right, then. I'll, I'll have to send him a copy of I Am Vengeance Retaliation. And That's get his right. Thoughts. Maybe, maybe we'll get him working on the third one. Right That's now. right. Oh, there we go. There it was. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can add math, that means uh, 2018, we, had, uh, we got Avengers. And 2020, we got Avengers 2. So if I'm doing the math correctly there, that means about 2022, we should be getting Avengers 3. Possibly. I think uh, if we get this vaccine that we all need, we may well <laughs> see one in 2022. If we don't, it may well be 2032. Who knows how that's going to turn out, right? <laughs> You're right about that. You're right about that. <laughs> Over to you, Ross. What's what's okay. going on with Vengeance 3? <laughs> well, there are two scripts for Vengeance 3, actually. Um, so two very different scripts for Vengeance 3. Uh, so they exist. Uh, let's see where we go. I mean, look, I know it's a bit cliche to say it, but, you know, Vengeance 2 needs to do well, and it's getting good responses, which is fantastic. But, you know, we need the audience to do sort of, you know, put their money where their mouth is, which sounds a bit clinical, uh, but it's true, uh, because we need to show how successful the film is to justify the third one. It's the yep. same with any franchise. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we have plans for it, for sure. So, you know, fingers crossed, onward and with The film is coming out across the world. Like, there's a whole bunch of territories where it's going to get released in the coming months, depending on their own, you know, their own restrictions or whatever they do. You know, every distributor in the territory has their own plan. So it sort of depends on all of that. Uh, but, you know, it's exciting you know, as, as, as a filmmaker you know, coming up and, and, and making these movies. You know, it's exciting to know that they are at least desired <laughs> by, by, you know, other territories as well as the audience at home. And of course, North America, we're we're very fortunate to work with Savannah Lionsgate. So, you know, it's, yeah. that's fantastic. So, you know, hope for the future. And as, we, as you mentioned earlier, this might be kind of a blessing in disguise because you've got everyone at home wanting something, you know, escapist, wanting something fun to watch. And then you have this great new movie come out that everyone can get instantly on demand. And it might just be kind of the right situation for that to happen, as, as terrible as the quarantine is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I just have a quick uh, little feature, although if you, if you all don't have the time for it, that's fine. But this is just uh, some rapid fire questions. What we like to do is kind of watch the film and take notes on what some of the characters do and then see if you, Stu Ben, and you, Ross, have, have done any of these things in real life outside of the acting career. <laughs> uh, so we can go right, quick. Then. You can sure. answer as much or as little as you want. You know, we will not, you know, we will not force you to answer any of these. Uh, so let's see. I guess, have you ever been in a fist fight? <laughs> Yes, many. <laughs> Lost count. Look at the shape of my nose. Probably been broken in excess of 10 times at this point. And I think most of those were fist fights in bars or growing up as a kid or in wrestling or, or whatever. So uh, haven't broken my nose on a film set yet, though. So that's that's probably Vengeance 3. There we go. Don't uh, give uh, Ross ideas. Vengeance 3 surgery. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm ashamed to say that I have been involved in a couple of scuffles of my own making many years ago. Uh, and I'm not proud of that. <laughs> Have you ever shot a gun? Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Yes. I, I've um, I've shot uh, you know, uh, skeet shooting, like clay pigeon shooting. Yeah. I've yeah. done that a couple of times and felt really kind of. It's really funny for a guy who makes action movies, and I love action movies, and I love uh, the action sequences, and I love my pipe, you know, my armor guys, and everything. I hate holding guns. I hate, I hate it. Like I feel physically <laughs> ill. When I shot, it was at a friend's stag party and I shot um, two pigeons. Not very well, but I shot them. And I was like, I had to give the gun back and go, oh, I'm done. It, I, it, felt, it was very unnerving for me. And my our armorer, who's fantastic, always makes me hold guns. Because he's like, you have to understand what it's like to hold this. Yeah. To, you know, if you're talking to actors, you have to understand. So not, not to sound like a downer. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I love working in that arena. I love it. Absolutely. Um, and I did that as a, as a human, if you like, holding a gun, I find very upsetting. Not my thing either. Right with you. Same. I, I have, but it is, it is kind of when you realize the power that you have in your hands, it's a little disturbing. It's too um, easy. It's too easy. Have you ever been in a car chase? 
I have, I have not. Actually, I've, I've kind of I've kind of been chased by somebody else by a, a crazy oh. wrestling fan after a show. I think it was actually in Washington D.C. of all places. Oh no! Was it, was it I was Vinnie in Jones? a car. It, no, it was Vinnie Jones before I met him. I think it was it was actually during the Nexus period. It was uh, myself, uh, Heath Slater, and Justin Gabriel, and I think Skip Sheffield who became Ryback. We were in a car and we were leaving an arena. And some crazy woman just started chasing us. I don't know if she wanted autographs or what, but we put our foot down. Ah, let's just get out of here. And suddenly we look, we look over our shoulder two minutes later and, and she's still there. We put oh our foot God. down, loser again. 30 minutes down the road, this woman is still kind of waving. Over. At this point, we're getting scared because once you leave DC, it gets very, the roads are very dark. There are no street lights. And so you know, this, this nutcase might have a gun. Who knows what's going on here? And mm. fortunately, in the end, we actually did the whole cowardly thing of pulling off, turning off the lights. <laughs> He went past, we got back on the highway and disappeared again. So, yeah, I've been the uh, recipient of, of being chased in the car, but I haven't oh. done the, the opposite yet. So, <laughs> Americans, they're crazy. Like, I'm terrified. Classy, DC. <laughs> I've been in a couple of car incidents, but not what you call a chase, just in oh, terms okay. of I I idiots on the road, but that's kind of. Have worst. you ever almost been blown up? Mm. When you say almost blown up, you mean actually with like explosives? Could be <laughs> fireworks, maybe. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's up to interpretation. You can answer as much or as little as you'd like. I've had a close. You can, you can pass as well. I've, I've had a close encounter with a firework, but that's like kind of a scary moment with a firework. That's as far as it goes. Like that counts. Yeah, yeah prob probably just a little too close for comfort on wrestling entrances. I used to have some pyrotechnics oh. on some of those. And at one point, I was I was with Chris Jericho. He was my manager, and he had this great explosive entrance. And um, I remember the first time I walked through the curtain with him, and I wasn't expecting it. I was so overawed by this audience that I was the first time I'd walked down, and suddenly this explosion goes off. I'm the guy who jumped while I'm on camera and terrified. Mm. So, yeah, I haven't actually been exploded, fortunately. There's still Vengeance 3, so... <laughs> the, the, the closest thing I've come to that, my second feature as director was called Ten Dead Men back in the day. And we filmed a, a shot of our lead actor. We did the classic car exploding with the actor walking towards us, like best showreel shot ever, right? And we first take it didn't quite work out, but the second take, I mean, the car went up like you just never see anything like it. <laughs> on, on a movie being made for no money, but like relatively, you know, we were very lucky. Um, and it looked incredible. And uh, our stunt coordinator was amazing. Uh, Jude Poyer, incredible, works with so many uh, gangs of London now and things like that. Um, and we've um, covered the back of the actor with like, you know, gel, stuff, you know, cold gel and all of that stuff. He was very safe. Um, but I will say us standing in front of the explosion, <laughs> filming it from multiple <laughs> angles or a couple of angles, uh, we, were, we were absolutely at a safe distance. But boy, if my, my eyebrows didn't singe. <laughs> like, I mean, it, you really, I, it was genuinely pressure and heat. Oh, no. Like, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, it looked incredible in the film as well. But, like, yeah, that was a moment where you kind of go, oh, am I about to die? Like, just, just in, in that split second, like, you feel the heat pushing <laughs> at you, right? That was, yeah, that's, that's probably the, the thing I should have said rather than a firework. That works. Uh, have you ever punched through a window? Nope, I have not, fortunately. I heard a horror story about Bill Goldberg once punching through a car window and tearing yeah. various arteries and tendons yeah. and being out for a long time with surgery. I think when he was in WCW, he did mm -hmm. that. So I've, I now, because of that one incident, have an extreme paranoia about punching yeah. glass. And I think that, that will be in my head forever. It's a bit like... Uh, sorry to anyone who's not a wrestling fan. Sid Vicious once jumped off the top rope in wrestling and landed on one leg. Um, yeah, and his leg oh, snapped. Oh, right. like, there's a horrible image of his bone just flopping around while he's in the ring. And to this day, I'm still paranoid about jumping off a rope and landing on one foot. And I, I don't think any wrestler will ever do that again because of that one incident. And it, to me, it's the same with Bill Goldberg punching the car window and tearing his tendons and all that mm. stuff. Ain't going to happen. Not for me. Mm. I have never punched through a window. Uh, <laughs> have you ever hotwired a car? I, I have no clue how to even begin doing that. It's, um, you know, my, my expertise are not very technical or anything like that. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Mm, I, I haven't, but what I will say is the, um, the hot wiring you see in I Am Vengeance Retaliation was absolutely based on a real way of doing it. Oh, huh? 
is absolutely based on some of all things YouTube tutorials. Educational. Of, of, how, of how, to, how to actually hotwire a car. <laughs> so that was, yeah, that, was, that was actually, even though we didn't actually do that on, on the actual car because the car was fine. You know, it was a mock, yeah. it was a mock uh, box sort of thing, but it was absolutely based on reality. So everyone should check out the movie because I bet well, we've all lost our keys. So now we'll need to know <laughs> cars in two months. I think, be, I think it kind of has to be an old car though, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. this is mostly just because I, I want to know where this line comes. I swear this was in the questions before you brought it up, but have you ever described someone as like herpes? <laughs> <laughs> Was this, was this a line that was used in the past? Uh, that's, that's, that's Ross's right, and I need to hear this answer. <laughs> actually, um, actually, it was half based. No, it wasn't something I, I'd say. So. It was half based on an Eddie Murphy joke. Ah. It was half based on an old Eddie Murphy joke where he says that herpes is like luggage and, <laughs> and you carry it around forever. Nah. So it was, it was, it was half ba- like just half based on that. And I just thought the idea of Vinny saying, or even the, whoever was going to play T initially, like back in the day uh like just the idea of the tough bad guy saying that to like the, because again they the, the other thing to remember about a moment like that is they've known each other for years like but before t turns traitor several years ago with with gold they saved each other's lives mm-hmm. on the streets mm-hmm. and all sorts of stuff right you can imagine they were like back to back in you know in bars fighting people all of that stuff right let alone on missions so some of that humor was supposed to simply be They'd said stuff like this before years ago, mm-hmm. really. Uh, we don't really bring that up, uh, per se, but that's why he can, like Teague, one of the things that Teague has got on gold in many ways is he wants gold just to be gold. Like this whole taking him to prison stuff, he knows that gold wants to kill him. So that, there's that kind of relationship, if you like. So that humor that kind of comes out between them here and there is absolutely based in the days when they would have literally been their yeah, comrades and aunts. But no, I've never had anyone say that I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> now I need to oh, check my yeah. doctor. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, that is time. I think, you know, I think, thank yeah. you so much for, you know, taking some time out of your days. I know that everyone's kind of sitting at home, but it still is always just a blast to talk to people in the industry and especially to talk to yeah. people that made movies that we'd loved. So. Thank you Ooh. so much. And uh, Nijia, David, uh, Najia, thank you so much. A lot of fun coming on here and thank you for helping us promote I Am Vengeance Retaliation. Hope everyone goes out and enjoys the movie and, and has a laugh and fingers crossed Ross can get Vengeance 3 underway very yeah. soon. And hope everyone stays Confirm. safe too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so yes, much. I, am, I Am Vengeance Retaliation is available everywhere on all digital platforms. Definitely check it out. Uh, you'll love it. And if you haven't seen the first one, I, I believe it's on Netflix, but even if you haven't, this one is a standalone. So just jump right up in there straight action 90 minutes go love it it's it's amazing uh and uh and see the you know. differences between the two movies right because it's you know it is definitely a different film yeah 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 and enough support we get we get three thank you just on your point about netflix for the first movie just to sort of sign off in, in some ways um we're not always kept up to date but you know distributors have their plans and everything and we try to stay in touch and everything we knew it was going to be on netflix we didn't know when um, and I flew to uh, Philadelphia. I have family in Philadelphia, in Germantown, wonderful people. And I flew there on Christmas Eve to meet my sister who lives in Miami and all of that. It was, gonna be, you know, it was a reunion, really. Uh, and I turned my phone on when I landed in Philadelphia. And like I say, I didn't know when the film was coming out on Netflix. My phone does that thing. I guess they call it explodes, what, you know, phone, whatever it is. It, it just explodes. Dude, your movie's on Netflix. So I was like, what? I mean, I mean, I'm talking like dozens and dozens of like Twitter and WhatsApp and everything. As I turn my phone back on, so the, the the people in the plane around me, like the phone turns on, ping pong, ping 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 pong, ping, ping, ping. <laughs> and I'm kind of going, what? What? And people are looking at me, going, who are you? Yeah. Who are you? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, so I, I, gotta, I gotta go. I gotta go first. Let me let me through, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I ever pulled something like that, my friends would put me in line very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you guys very soon. Again, good deal. Talk about part three. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>